The Great I Am, Part 4 I am the Good Shepherd. John 10, verse 11 says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the fourth of the seven instances where Jesus invokes the I Am terminology, which implies that he is divine. In this fourth I Am statement, I am the Good Shepherd is a separate analogy, related but not identical to the ones we discussed earlier. First, we must understand the role of a shepherd. Shepherds not only had to keep watch over the flock to prevent them from straying, but have to defend the sheep from animals like wolves, bears, as well as thieves. Jesus used the term shepherd as a metaphor to help the people of the time understand better who he was. There had been many prophets and religious leaders who were seen as shepherds to their people, but among them were Pharisees and scribes, whom Jesus identified as false and evil shepherds, whose wicked motives were rooted in hypocrisy, pride, unbelief, and selfishness. David's experience of shepherding shows that it was not easy nor safe, according to 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 to 36. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David gives us an example of what is involved in shepherding sheep. Jacob narrates the struggles that a shepherd faces while attending to sheep in Genesis 31, verses 38 to 40. These twenty years, I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was. In the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. By proclaiming that I am the Good Shepherd, Jesus is saying, I am not a selfish shepherd who will run away, but I will stand and defend the sheep in my flock. He was contrasting himself with those shepherds who wreak havoc on the flock for their own gain. He is saying, I am not a thief. Jesus offers life, and life in abundance, according to John 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. As a good shepherd, he preserves and protects the life of the sheep. He puts his life on the line for the flock. Having said that, Jesus' words foreshadow the idea that his earthly mission and purpose is to die on behalf of his sheep. Jesus was a shepherd of the Father's appointing, calling, and sending to care for his sheep, the chosen ones. He was sent to find the lost sheep and was entrusted with them. He is a good shepherd, protects them from their enemies, heals all their diseases, and restores their souls. He watches the sheep in the night season, lest anything hurt them. He is the Good Shepherd, who goes out to search for the sheep when they have been driven away or scattered in the dark and cloudy day, so that he loses none, according to John 17, verse 12. While I was with them in the world, 
I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. John 10, verses 1 to 2. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd knows his sheep by name, and the sheep know the shepherd by his voice. When the shepherd gives a command, the sheep hearken to his voice and follow him. But the thief is a stranger to them, and the sheep refuse to follow the stranger. John 10 verse 5 says, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. We must constantly develop our relationship with the Holy Spirit, as this will heighten our awareness of his voice. We should not allow our ears to be out of tune with his voice. If we do that, we are in danger of allowing other influences to permeate our lives. Remember that the stranger has an interest in us as well. He is relentlessly trying to climb into our lives through illegitimate means. He is always speaking and shouting in an attempt to crowd out the voice of the Spirit. The only counter we have to the enemy's voice is the voice of God. As the Lord sheep, we must know his voice and listen to it through our relationship. But we are also called to follow his voice in obedience. This is the truest sign of the sheep. Those of us who belong to Jesus Christ must obey his voice. Listening is not just about the entry of the words, but about changing our lives to align with the words we hear. Are you committed to following the voice of the Good Shepherd? Jesus is speaking figuratively, but as he explains the parable, he introduces himself in a few variables that are of comfort to my heart as a sheep, and I know they will comfort yours as well. Firstly, Jesus states in John 10 verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He is the only avenue to get into the proverbial pen, which we know is the kingdom of God, that has been given to Jesus by his Father. He builds on this in John 10 verses 9 to 10, stating, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. The sheep are given salvation from the stranger who is a thief, a robber, and a killer. Secondly, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, in John 10 verse 11. He is not an interim attendant to the sheep, he is the owner. Further on in the chapter, we see a third person who has an interest in the sheep. But this person's interest will not drive them to protect the sheep with his life. He is only a hired hand and doesn't care for the sheep in the same way that the shepherd does. The relationship that the shepherd has with the sheep inspires him to lay down his life for the sheep. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, Jesus declares in John 10 verse 14. Those of us who have entered through Jesus Christ into the kingdom of God are the sheep of the Lord. He cares for us. He speaks to us. He died for us. He gives us abundant life. He knows us, and we know him. It is only the sheep of Jesus that listens to his voice. Jesus is the fullness of the voice of God. We can, in a real sense, say that he is God's final word and the Good Shepherd. May the Lord keep you. God bless you.
I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life is the fifth of the seven I am statements of Jesus found in the Gospel of John. God referred to him using the I am expression in Exodus 3 verse 14. This is a statement of God's absolute, necessary and eternal existence. This is the definition of God, the one who just is, who must be. And Jesus used the same terminology several times to connect his messages and ministry to that of God. And in doing so, he conveyed a message to them that he was God and equal with God. John 11 verse 25 Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Jesus spoke these words to a woman named Martha after the death of her brother. We see Jesus comforting Martha in John 11 verse 23. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha assumed that Jesus was referring to the resurrection of the dead at the end of time. So Martha replied him in John 11 verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha viewed this future resurrection as something distant and remote. She completely missed the fact that the true source of life and resurrection was standing right in front of her. Jesus boldly and rightly declared that, I am the resurrection and the life. Here Jesus made two claims in this I am statement. Firstly, I am the resurrection. This, I believe, was in reference to three different resurrections that were to occur in the future. First being Jesus' own resurrection three days after dying on the cross. This death and resurrection were in order to save sinners like us and allow us to also be resurrected in Christ. This brings us to the second resurrection Jesus was referring to and also the statement, I am the life. When we read Romans 8 verse 10 and 11, this is made clear to us. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Once you give your life to Christ, you are saved from the darkness of sin and brought into the light of righteousness. Romans 5 verse 10 tells us that if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We are no longer enemies of God, but we have been saved through the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross. We are now children of God. Living a life without God can only lead to death and destruction. But Jesus came to give us life. That is why he states, I am the resurrection and the life. John 10 verse 10 The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. He does not give us a spiritual life here on earth, but he gives us eternal life. 1 John 5 verse 11 and 12 And this is the testimony 
that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This brings us to the third and final resurrection to which I believe he was referencing, which is the final resurrection at the end of time. This is also what Martha believed Jesus was talking about. Jesus is the only way to this resurrection and eternal life. This means that when we lose our loved ones, as long as they believed in Christ, they are going to be resurrected one day and their body and spirit will be rejoined forever. And they will have new and glorified bodies, which the Apostle Paul described as, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Although we all are sinners, Romans 3 verse 22 to 26 says, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is why Jesus states that as I am the life, he is the only way to the final resurrection and eternal life. There is no other way but through him, and don't let anyone convince you otherwise. He is not the way to resurrection. He is not the way to life. He is life. He is the resurrection. Jesus left no room for doubting what he said. There is no room for negotiating. He is the answer, the solution, and the cure to death. Through him we can receive eternal life. All we need to do is believe in him. Believe that he died and rose again. Believe that he is what he says he is. The resurrection and the life. The denial of Jesus Christ as Master and Savior will have results and the refusal to believe in him as such will have the same consequences. We must be willing to affirm that Jesus is who the scripture reveals him to be and we must also place our unwavering faith in him to save us from our sins. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. These are the words found in Matthew 10 verse 33. This verse has a blessed eternal hope echoed in it. It is one that we can, as the proverbial saying goes, take to the bank. It is an assurance from Jesus of the blessings attached to confessing Jesus. However, when we read the next verse, we find a warning from Jesus. One all believers should take heed of and remember. This is not something that should be taken lightly. Matthew 10 verse 34 says, But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus did not just claim to be the resurrection and the life at the funeral of Lazarus, but he proved it. He asked to be taken to where the tomb where his friend's body had been for four days. Jesus asked that the stone covering the entrance to the burial cave be removed. 
John 11 verse 41 to 44 says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him, and let him go. Jesus will come back to get his saints. Those who believed will be given eternal life. The truth is no matter how long Jesus tarries at the appointed time, he will show up. Therefore, let us keep our hopes high in him. Hebrews 9 verse 28 So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Apart from sin, for salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the sixth I am statement of Jesus. Jesus made this statement shortly before his arrest and his crucifixion and these words broadly encourage believers to maintain faith in the face of hardship. Confidence comes to believers partly when they know that Jesus is preparing to take them to be with him. Normally, traveling home is usually less stressful than the outbound trip since we are so much more familiar with the destination. For Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I am the way, the truth, and the life is a statement which Jesus made when he was responding to Thomas's question in John 14 verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we can know the way. Christ's answer reinforces a doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, as well as denying the assumption that there are many paths and ways to God. Acts 11 verse 26 And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So, before the label Christians, faith in Jesus was often referred to as the way, according to Acts 24 verse 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. When Jesus said, I am the way, he was addressing our very human instinct so that we know where we are going before we start the journey. He said this also to let the disciples know their next step, their next turn, and the ultimate destination of where this journey of faith would lead them. 
Just like in real life, when we have a long journey or trip ahead of us, we turn on our GPS for directions and to get an idea of how long it will take and see the roads we will travel to get there. Thomas was looking for the same kind of information. Jesus said he would come to get them in John 14 verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. This is true, because the way to salvation is not a process, but it is a person. It is through and only through the person of Christ. He is the means and the way to salvation. Jesus is the way to the Father. We cannot strive to earn heaven. We can only seek to follow Christ. And this is how believers are to know God, according to John 14, verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. The disciples knew how to get where Jesus was going because they knew him. They knew the way, because the way is Jesus. And eventually men like Thomas will connect with Jesus' declaration that I am the way and the truth and the life. Christ made this declaration and reassured his disciples, as well as us, that faith in him is faith in God. Jesus makes it clear that the disciples, as well as us believers, will not have a defined way like the one we find on the satellite navigation, but we are tasked with simply knowing Jesus following his teachings, walking in faith that he is the way and trusting him daily. We are to abide in him and the rest in comfort of faith that he will lead us exactly where we need to go as we walk in him. And to know Christ is to know the way and the truth and the life. Christ's words, actions and miracles must give believers the confidence to trust him, that he will make good on his promises. Among those are his guarantee that he is preparing a place for us, and not only preparing a place for us, but also that he will come for us, so that we can be where he is as the way to the Father, the truth of God, and the life. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, and the life. We want to know what he meant when he said that I am the truth and how we can know the truth. After Jesus had been arrested, he found himself standing before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. Among other things, it had been rumored he called himself a king. In speaking to him, Pilate found no evidence of any crime worthy of death, but was fascinated by his speech about the truth, according to John 18, verse 37, which says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth here is my voice. Pilate said to him, What is the truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate asked Jesus, What is truth? As we see it, the question had already been answered in John 14, when Jesus had told the disciples that I am the truth. Jesus can testify and teach the truth because he himself is that truth. In him there is nothing false, nothing misleading, and nothing fake or uncertain. As believers, we are capable of knowing the truth because we know Jesus, but we cannot claim to be truth ourselves. There are too many things that we don't know and seek God for answers. 
and there are too many things we get wrong in our lives. As believers, we are to seek Jesus, and seeking Him ultimately leads us to seek the truth. When we seek to figure out what is truth and what is a lie, we can measure it against the Word of God, which is Jesus, who Himself is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Acts 17 verse 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being, meaning our very existence and life is hidden in Christ Jesus. The atoms, the breath of life, the motivation, everything. He is the source of all that we are. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus teaches that he came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. The life we are living now is not our ultimate goal and does not encompass the entirety of who we are. Jesus teaches us that we are to be concerned with eternal life. We are not to chase after things that don't last, but we are to pursue things that do last and have eternal significance. When Jesus refers to himself as the way, the truth, and the life, he is giving us a better way to live our lives through him. He is showing us that through following him daily in faith, Jesus will lead us to a better, richer, and more meaningful life than we could ever find on our own. John 1 verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. God bless you.